This is News Center 5. Coverage you can count on. New at 11, a youth hockey coach in hot water. Players say he attacked the referee. We talked to eyewitnesses. New at 11, controversy over a t-shirt. As Massachusetts voters head to the polls tomorrow, one retailer suggests some young voters shouldn't. Also, she thought her baby had died in a fire until her mother's intuition led her to the truth. And antibacterial soaps. We wash away the claims to find out if they really keep you from getting sick. Well, the coach was going crazy on the referee, too. He says it was a clean check. New at 11, a youth hockey player speaks out about a controversial call that led to rage in the rink. Good evening, everyone. A young referee became the target of that rage, attacked by a coach during a youth hockey game last night. And tonight, police are considering charges. Sonia Pfeiffer has our local live coverage tonight in Medford. Sonia? Anthony, assistant Melrose hockey coach Paul Johnson should have been here at Flynn Rink tonight with his team for practice. Instead, Mass Hockey is considering banning him from rinks, and Winthrop police are considering assault charges. The Melrose Youth Hockey Bantam B team is practicing without their assistant coach, Paul Johnson, tonight. In a rough game between Melrose and Everett last night at this rink in Winthrop, Johnson allegedly attacked the referee. I know it's hard for some people to believe at this point, but the reputation of the coach that was involved is an excellent one. And uh, I've been involved in this program for a long time. Uh, Paul Johnson is a good man. Uh, this was definitely an isolated incident, uh, something in the heat of the battle. Uh, his son was involved, uh, so I think his instincts as a parent took over. Melrose President Frank Sorrenti suspended Johnson indefinitely, but says he still stands by him, characterizing last night's outburst as an aberration. Recovering referee Paul Sorello thinks the whole incident gives hockey a bad rap. It doesn't make hockey look too good. I mean, well, all you sports, I mean, everyone's trying to get with these zero-tolerance zero things, and, you know, we're trying to enforce it, and when that happens... Johnson allegedly assaulted Sorello after a player from Everett checked Johnson's son. Peter Chiarello is the Everett player who did the checking. No, the coach was going crazy and the referee too. He threw uh, the coach out of the rink. I thought it was like a penalty or something. I thought I was getting thrown out. But it's Johnson who was out and now out indefinitely. A hearing in district court on March 9th will determine if criminal charges will be filed. Meantime, Mass Hockey and USA Hockey are convening to have hearings over the next 7 to 10 days to decide a course of action on their part. It could mean permanent suspension from youth hockey for Johnson. Live in Medford for News Center 5 tonight, I'm Sonia Pfeiffer. Anthony, back to you. Sonia, thank you. An elderly couple remains hospitalized tonight, hours after their car smashed into a Dorchester home. 85-year-old Francis V. Hilly somehow lost control of his mercury sable and went through the brick foundation of the vacant house on Neponset Avenue. He and his 80-year-old wife, Josephine, were taken to the hospital. They are both listed in fair condition tonight, and so far, no charges have been filed. Boston police say they have the man who murdered a drugstore worker in the city's Longwood neighborhood last month. Christian Jambroni was stabbed to death after he and another CVS employee chased a shoplifting suspect out of their store. Daniel Rogers, who was already in jail on unrelated charges, will now be charged tomorrow with Jambroni's murder. He also be charged with stabbing and wounding the second CVS worker and threatening a third. A man with ties to Massachusetts is being questioned by the FBI for driving his SUV into a Hawaii airport lobby and setting it on fire. The incident grounded flights for several hours yesterday, but the FBI says no one was injured and it was not an act of terrorism. The driver was 52-year-old Paul Blatchley. He's not yet been charged. Blatchley was the co-owner of a botanical garden in Monson, Massachusetts that is no longer in business. The SUV he smashed into the Hawaiian airport and set ablaze was registered to his former business partner, Francis Lobick of Monson. And new at 11 tonight, a clothing chain with local stores is coming under fire tonight for selling T-shirts, some say, sends the wrong message. Here is the T-shirt in question. It says, voting is for old people. And on the eve of Super Tuesday, it is raising some eyebrows. Jim Morelli is live in Harvard Square with our local live coverage. Jim? Anthony, there was a time when you could go across the street to this Urban Outfitters over here and pick up one of these t-shirts right off the shelf. Well, they still have them in stock, but not on display. The clothing retailer taking some major heat for making this political statement. I think that's terrible. Voting is for everybody. 
political statement or fashion blunder. On the eve of primary voting in 10 U.S. states, Urban Outfitters peddles a perhaps unintentionally profound message to young voters. Don't bother. It says voting is for old people. They're selling this over at Urban Outfitters. What do you think about that message? I think it's really lame. In fact, we found age no barrier when it came to outrage over the T-shirts. It's very hip to be aloof, and that's why that's on that shirt. It's a thing you should do. You let people die to vote. Outrage also at Harvard's Institute of Politics, its director urging Urban Outfitters to exchange the message of apathy for one of activism. Urban Outfitters defended the shirts, but today pulled them off the shelves at the Harvard Square store, acknowledging some people took offense. No kidding. I mean, my opinion about Urban Outfitters is that it's not about what matters, it's about what's cool. Voting is for old people, of course, for young people and those in the middle. The freedom not to cast a ballot, a result, ironically, of being able to do so. And here is another shot of the controversial t-shirt in question, a t-shirt that, who knows, may become a collector's item if current trends of repulsion hold. The cost, by the way, of these t-shirts, 28 bucks. Live in Harvard Square, Jim Morelli, New Center 5. Liz? All right, Jim, thank you. Protesters for the people, excuse me, protesters with people for the ethical treatment of animals, or PETA as they are well known, took off their clothes today to protest the fur industry. The group of nearly naked people, five women and one man, camped out at Harvard Square earlier this afternoon. It's part of a PETA campaign called Rather Go Naked Than Wear Fur. The demonstration attracted quite a crowd of onlookers and, of course, the police, who covered the women with hospital robes and arrested all six protesters for indecent exposure. New tonight, one of the Bay State's most wanted deadbeat parents is under arrest. Police caught up with Peter Wetterland in Florida. He's from Cheshire, and the Massachusetts Department of Revenue says he has not made a child support payment since 1996 and owes nearly $65,000. This latest most wanted list came out just last week. Anthony? Liz, a remarkable story out of Philadelphia tonight where a mother has found her young daughter more than six years after being told her infant had died in a house fire. Luz Cuevas always believed her daughter was alive, but how she found her and what happened almost seven years ago is a story of chance, deceit, and incredible maternal instinct. It was 1997 when Delamar Vera, just 10 days old, was believed to have died in this house fire. Her body was never found. Fire investigators believed it was consumed in the inferno. Then, this January, her mother, Luz Cuevas, attended a birthday party and saw a girl she believed was her daughter. Motherly instinct. Motherly instinct without getting a DNA, nothing. She sees the child and says, this is my child. She managed to get a few strands of the girl's hair, convinced police to reopen the investigation, and DNA tests revealed it was, in fact, Luz Cuevas' daughter. So what happened? Police now believe the child was kidnapped and raised by 41-year-old Carolyn Correa. Correa was a friend of Delamar's father and visited the home the night before the fire. Police now say she kidnapped Delamar Vera from her crib set the fire to cover her tracks and disappear. It's going to be difficult for the child. I mean, uh, after all, you know, she grew up with a woman knowing a woman as her mother, but is in fact her kidnapper. So it's going to be a very difficult psychological process, an emotional process of reunification. Police are now searching for Carolyn Correa, who lives in Willingboro, New Jersey. As for six-year-old Delamar Vera, she is now in state custody in New Jersey, and there is no word yet on when she will be reunited with her mother. Commitment 2004 news right now, and anyone voting in tomorrow's Massachusetts primary will have to take a good look at the ballot. The first five candidates listed in the presidential primary have all dropped out. And as you can see, the five remaining candidates and a no preference vote are below all of those names. Now, polls in Massachusetts are open from 7 in the morning until 8 tomorrow night. The Secretary of State is predicting only about a 25 percent turnout, but that's not slowing down the leading candidates on the eve of Super Tuesday. John Kerry is hoping for 10 more primary wins. Tuitions keep going up year after year. Health care costs keep going up year after year. Show me the American family whose income has gone up anywhere close to the cost of living or to the way in which some of these companies are driving prices in America. Over the last 30 years, working people's pay in America has gone up about 10%. CEO pay, 3,000%.
What is wrong with this picture? This is not the country you and I believe in. The truth is we live in two different Americas. All of you know that. We have one America for all those families to get whatever they want, whatever they need it. Then we got one for everybody else. It doesn't have to be that way. You and I can change it. We can build one America where we no longer have two health care systems, one for families that get the best health care money can buy, and then one for everybody else, given out by insurance companies, drug companies, HMOs. It doesn't have to be that way. And so help me. When I am president, we will hold that health care up as the gold standard of the United States, and we will make certain that the United States of America stops being the only industrial country on the face of this planet that doesn't understand that health care is not a privilege for the wealthy and the powerful. It is a right for all Americans. Channel 5 will carry live election updates after the polls close tomorrow evening. And our own political reporter, Janet Wu, will be in Washington, D.C. with the Kerry campaign. You can watch her live reports tomorrow at 6 and, of course, at 11. The Bush administration is flatly denying charges that the American military forced Haitian President Jean-Bertrand Aristide into exile. Aristide arrived yesterday at his temporary exile in Central Africa, but tonight by telephone he told CNN he was forced at gunpoint to give up power. The Bush administration says the claim is ridiculous that Aristide signed a letter of resignation and left Haiti willingly. He was not kidnapped. We did not force him onto the airplane. He went onto the airplane willingly. Uh, and that's the truth. It's nonsense. We took steps to protect Mr. Aristide. We took steps to protect his family uh, as they departed Haiti. It was Mr. Aristide's decision to resign. Cheers and celebration greeted Haitian rebels as they entered Haiti's capital today. Some of the rebels ransacked the presidential palace. Late developments in the Kobe Bryant case. His accuser may not testify after all. And also new at 11, they promise to protect, but we put antibacterial soaps to the test to see if they really do make a difference. I know you like the way March began today. Now, we do see a little wet weather on the way. Not too much to be concerned with, but I'll take you through the rest of the week in a couple of days. You're watching News Center 5 at 11. Local live coverage you can count on. Tonight's financial update is brought to you by Fleet, helping you make smarter decisions with your money so you can move forward with confidence. Closed caption funding provided by Liberty Mutual Insurance. It's more than insurance. It's insurance in action. You're watching News Center 5 at 11 with Anthony Everett, Liz Bruner, meteorologist Harvey Leonard, and Mike Lynch on sports. Now, local live coverage continues. Kobe Bryant's accuser will not take the stand tomorrow in day two of a hearing in the NBA star sexual assault case. Late this evening, a judge decided to reconsider whether to allow defense attorneys to ask the alleged victim detailed questions about her sexual past. Now, Bryant's attorneys have claimed that the woman had sex within 15 hours after the alleged attack by Bryant and that the injuries she sustained could have been caused by someone else. New at 11, a new worm dubbed NetSky D is quickly making its way through email systems worldwide. The worm lands in email boxes using a number of different ordinary looking subject lines such as here is the document. Once the email is open, the virus rapidly multiplies, slowing down computer systems. The best thing to do with this file is to delete it as soon as possible. Do not open it. Well, if you are guilty of having an explosive temper, your health could be in serious jeopardy. New research shows hot-headed men with extreme tempers have a 10% greater risk than non-hostile men of developing a heart flutter, which could lead to a stroke or even death. Angry women, on the other hand, don't run as high a risk as their male counterparts. The findings come from the second generation of the famous Framingham Heart Study. In the battle to keep from getting coughs and colds, Americans spend millions of dollars on antibacterial soaps and cleaners. But their claims may be all washed up if you believe the results of a new study. College sophomore Vanessa Gall is serious about cleanliness. So serious that she buys antibacterial soap for her entire dorm bathroom. What's she so afraid of? Germs, diseases, especially living in a dorm. A lot of people, you know, get sick and when everybody gets sick, 
Vanessa's not alone. Consumers are snapping up more and more products advertised antibacterial. It makes us feel safer, and so we're more inclined to buy a product that says it than not, especially if there's not much of a price difference. But we may all be kidding ourselves if we think antibacterial products keep us from getting sick, according to a new study. Columbia University researchers followed 224 families. Half were given soaps and household cleaners with antibacterial agents. Half were given identical products with no special ingredients. Researchers looked for symptoms including fever, cough, diarrhea, vomiting, and pink eye. After 11 months, we found no significant difference at all in infectious disease symptoms between those who use the antibacterial products and those who use the plain products. Experts in the field aren't surprised by the results. Most common illnesses like the cold and flu are caused by viruses, not bacteria. So antibacterial products wouldn't be effective anyway. But a lot of consumers don't understand the difference or care. It's still, I guess it's a mental thing. And it just, I just feel cleaner if I, you know, use the product. Overuse of antibacterial products could cause a rise in resistant bacteria or give consumers a false sense of security. Some people will take away from it the message that I don't need to wash as often because this is killing the germs, therefore my hands are so sterile after I've washed them that I don't need to wash as often. And in fact, then I'll be more at risk of disease transmission. Now, doctors tell us that washing your hands and covering your mouth when you cough and sneeze is actually the best way to keep germs from spreading. But the soap and detergent industry insists their antibacterial products do perform as promised and can be effective against bacteria that cause skin infections and food poisoning like salmonella and E. coli. But our experts point out those conditions do not pose as great a risk as viral infections. Now, meteorologist Harvey Leonard and the Storm Track 5 forecast. What a start to the month of March. Almost shirt sleeve like weather in parts of our area for a while this past day. Of course, the question is, is that a sign of things to come? Well, it certainly reflects what happened this past weekend when it was really beautiful out there as well. So I think we could safely say with March 1st almost into the books, it has definitely come in like a lamb this year. 50 in Boston, 61 in places like Millis. Last year, a little more like a lion. It was 40 degrees with some mixed rain and snow. And you know, this past day did start chilly in some of the outlying areas. Taunton, Gardner, uh, Springfield and Millis were all in the 20s. But look at the temperature jump up to the upper 50s and low 60s, even a record high at Kennedy Airport. Well, you know, December, January, and February, we kind of consider meteorological winter. They're usually the three harshest winter months. And it turned out that December was slightly above normal in temperature, and so was February. But it was much below in January, enough so, coldest January since the 1800s, to make the winter average colder than normal, in spite of the fact that two of the three months were actually above normal. This is the one we're going to remember. We'll tell our kids and grandkids about that incredibly cold January of 2004. And we started out gangbusters in snow the first half of December, but really tapered off in January and February. Almost no snow at all since December 14th. Strange winter indeed. 41 in Boston now, still fairly mild. Southerly wind at 9 miles per hour. We'll check some of our temperatures elsewhere. And it's generally in the upper 30s and low 40s. The ocean water temperature is about 37, and we shouldn't fall too much more for the rest of tonight. Some clouds have definitely moved in and there are a couple of showers showing to the west so tomorrow I mean there could be a little bit of rain around but I think there'll be more clouds than anything else just a couple of showers will move through and it's still going to turn out to be another pretty mild day so that's how we're depicting it in fact by late tomorrow tomorrow evening just when the sun's setting skies will start to clear and that sets us up for nice weather on Wednesday because the air is not really that cold behind that system at all we should easily make 50 to 55 in spite of breezy conditions with a good deal of sunshine on Wednesday. Overall, things are looking up. The only real chilly weather is back over the northern plains, and it looks like this will be a much above normal temperature week for the first week of March. So we'll start with tonight's weather, 35 to 42. Thickening clouds, southerly breeze. For most of us, I think the morning commute will be rain-free anytime from there on into the early afternoon. Just a shower or two around south-southwest winds and mild again in the afternoon, 45 to 55. So we'll check out the entire week for you. Look at the high temperatures dazzle you, considering it's only the beginning of March. We will have perhaps another round of a little bit of wet weather along about Thursday and Friday. But again, it doesn't look like we're going to get too much heavy rain this week. It's been very, very dry. Top of Blue Hill, where they keep weather records. The combination of January and February, the driest January-February combo ever. 
So it has really, really been dry. But, you know, springtime will give us some wet weather. I don't uh, think I don't, we have to worry about that. We're not talking about drought now. We've <laughs> Way been too through early. that already. <laughs> okay. Thanks, All right, Harvey. Harvey, thank you. Next on News Center 5, this is a rarity. It's one of those nights when you can stand up and cheer for the Celtics. Woo. Mike Lynch is next with sports. <laughs> Live with Mike Lynch, this is Sports Center 5. Well, there hasn't been too much to get excited about during the Celtics season, but tonight is an exception. Celts have won three in a row, and tonight they got a 28-point, 21-rebound performance from Mark Blount in their cakewalk win over the Magic tonight. Now, there haven't been too many times when you want to get up and just holler, but I'll tell you what, watch this play right here by Ricky Davis. Oh, my goodness. Actually shook the building for the first time in a long time. Now, as for Blount, how about this? 28-21. The first Celtic to have a 20-20 night in 10 years. The last guy to have 20 points and more than 20 rebounds in the game. Eddie Pinkney did it back in 1994. Celtics came out in the fourth quarter and scored the first 25 points of the quarter. 25-0 run. That's right. How do you lose when you play like that? They don't. Mark Blount, good for him. Celtics win 117 to 96. Three in a row, and they are knocking on the playoff door. Will Ted Washington be in a Patriots uniform next season? The Boston Herald says yes, but Washington's agent says tonight that a deal has not yet been agreed upon, and that Washington is now furious because there is no deal. Washington, 36 years old, plays in the middle, made 1.65 million last year. Meanwhile, the Super Bowl runner-up Carolina Panthers have signed a five-year deal with Steve Smith, their brilliant wide receiver who caught 88 passes during the regular season. 19 more of them during the playoffs, including one touchdown pass against the Patriots. Elsewhere, as teams scramble to get under the $80 million salary cap, some big names are falling. The Bills cut guard Reuben Brown. The Jets released Mo Lewis. The Bears said so long to Cordell Stewart. They never should have said hello to him in the first place. And the Falcons cut Ray Buchanan. And we finished tonight with some high school hockey. Winthrop is in white playing against Peabody. We all know the story about Winthrop Athletics. It's threatened to wipe them out next year. This Nick Martino and Matt Driscoll combining to put the Vikings on top, 1-0. And watch this great drop pass here by Driscoll. And Paul Aruzioni, number 11, likes...